Congressman Will Hurd. Dr. Irving, thank you uh, for that introduction and, and the invitation, and congratulations on 15 years of, of excellence. And to the class of, of 2015, I'm thrilled to be with you on such a special occasion. Now, Dr. Irving told you a little bit about me, and before I start my remarks, I want to know a little bit about y'all. Now, I know he said put away all the noisemakers and all that stuff, but y'all can use it for the next minute or so. So if I say something, I want to say a couple of sta statements, and if that statement is true for you, I want you to stand up, yell, holler, do whatever, cause general commotion, all right? So here we go. I'm from San Antonio. There we go. All right, all right. I'm from H-Town. I'm a friend or family member of Kalia Terrell. <laughs> You know, I saw all the shirts when y'all came in. Come on, I expect y'all to be more hyped than that. Come on now, all those shirts. <laughs> Thank y'all. All right now. All right, Kalia, girl, you brought a lot of people here to the show. I've spent time at Dr. Wilson's dumpster. You know, I, I knew that dumpster before it was actually a dumpster. It was called our, our college dorm room at, at Texas A&M. I've enjoyed Catfish Friday a time or two. I'm excited about my new job. I'm excited that my son or daughter's got a new job. <laughs> Y'all ready to get him out of the house, huh? I've had Dr. Old Mixon bucks my chops before. <laughs> well, look, this is, this is an honor to be here with, with y'all today. And if I'm being frank, I didn't know what I was going to say until about six days ago. I was in the back of a cargo plane, a C-130, traveling from ba Baghdad to Jerusalem. I was on a congressional delegation. And there was 12 of us, and we'd only been in the Middle East about 18 hours, so we were a little jet-lagged. And if you've ever ridden in the back of a cargo plane, a C-130, let me tell you, it's not comfortable. You kind of sit in these things, it's like a really hard hammock, and you're constantly shaking because the plane's always shaking. There's this strange pale green light that emits through the entire the cargo hold. And I was sitting there writing some, some comments um, about my reflections for the day. And I realized what I should tell y'all. I realized I should just tell y'all the best piece of advice I've gotten in the last couple of years. It's a piece of advice I got five years ago. But it was only until recently that I realized it's a piece of advice that I've been following all my life. And that piece of advice is do something meaningful and hard. Now, to understand why that was important to me, you got to understand where I was when I got that piece of advice. As, as Dr. Irvin said, I grew up in San Antonio, went to Texas A&M University, studied computer science, and up until my freshman year in college, I had never been outside of Texas. And I saw a sign on, on campus that said, take two journalism classes in Mexico City for $425. And I had $450 in my bank account, so I went to Mexico, fell in love, enjoyed being in another culture, enjoyed um, learning about things I had never learned before, and added international studies as a minor when I got back to Texas A&M. And the first class I took, we had a guest lecturer, and he was a former senior officer in the Central Intelligence Agency, and he told me some of the most amazing stories I've, I've ever heard. And the next day, I went and knocked on his door and said, tell me more. And he told me some more amazing stories. And that began my interest in intelligence and began my interest in going in the CIA. Now, I had always thought I was going to be a computer programmer for IBM. I'd done an internship with IBM. Um, when I got close to graduation, I applied. And they offered me a really good paying job. And I went ahead and applied to be in the National Clandestine Service of the CIA. And I accepted that job. And that wasn't a good paying job. You know, it was about a third of what IBM was offering, but I took it anyways. Now, my dad thought I was crazy. And my dad, up until this point, had never really told me what to do except for one time 
when I was leaving San Antonio to go to Texas A&M, he said, son, you should break up with your girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. I was outraged, right? And I had a freak out like only a 17-year-old boy could. And less than a year later, we had a messy breakup. And I wish I would have listened to my dad. But this time he said, listen, you, IBM pays more and it's not as dangerous. But he realized very quickly that I liked to challenge and wanted to do something impactful. And so I joined the CIA. And I was the dude in the back alleys at 4 o'clock in the morning recruiting spies and collecting intelligence on threats to the homeland. I lived in D.C. for two years, India two years, Pakistan for two years, New York City for two years, and Afghanistan for a year and a half. It was a great job. I did things like chase al-Qaeda all over the world. I helped a million girls go to college by getting rid of the Taliban outside of Afghanistan. Well, you can clap for that. I saw things and did things I never imagined I would do. It was a really hard job, and it was awesome being part of an organization that helped make the world a safer place. One of the other things I did when I was the CIA was brief members of Congress. And I probably briefed about 100 members of Congress, and I was pretty um, disappointed in the caliber of our elected officials. And my mama said, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. So I left a job I was good at. I left a job that I loved in order to run for Congress. There was five of us, and after about nine months, I came out on top, didn't have uh, the 50% of the votes I needed, went to a runoff. And folks that followed elections was like, Will Hurd's got this in the bag. Will Hurd's going to win. My opponent thought I was going to win. The people that worked for him had put out their resumes to find another job. But when the, when the votes were counted, I lost by 700 votes. It was devastating. Losing sucks. And... I didn't know what I was going to do next. I was upset because I felt like I let a lot of people down. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't have a plan B. And I did not know what my next step was going to be. I didn't really know what I was going to do. And some of y'all probably understand that. Some of y'all probably don't know what your next step is. Some of y'all are probably nervous about your future. But get used to it because this is going to continue to happen in many phases of your life. You will feel this way many times in your life, so figure out a way to deal with this situation so you can repeat it whenever you're finding yourself contemplating your next move. For me, I decided to ask as many people as I could to get some advice. And I talked to 75 people, and I asked them two questions. The first question was, if you were 32, what would you do? I was 32 at the time. And the second question was, if time and money wasn't an issue, what would you do? And after asking those two questions to 75 people, you know what I learned? Not a damn thing. <laughs> Pardon my language. Uh, it, was, it was really disappointing. But I was glad that the 75th person I asked was the dad of one of my closest friends that I've known since I was 13 years old. And he said, Will, I don't know what you should do. But if you do something meaningful and hard, all that other stuff will work its way out. Meaningful and hard. You know, I didn't realize how important that piece of advice was at the time because I thought it was too simplistic. After that, I decided to join some colleagues, join a consulting firm. We helped companies add employees to, the, to their payroll. We helped protect the digital infrastructure of companies that were being attacked by cr cyber criminals and by state sponsors of hacking. I was doing things that I had never done before and I was loving it. And the opportunity came to run for office again in 2014 and I left a job I was really good at, a job I loved in order to run. And this time I won. Thank you. I've been in office for four months now and every day, I make decisions that are going to impact a whole lot of people. And I'm glad I have experience in doing things that are meaningful and hard. Now, let me see by show of hands, how many of y'all have ever read that book, Freakonomics, by Stephen, Levine, or Stephen, Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner? Well, in this book, they popularize the concept that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to be really good at something. Right, and I speak at a lot of middle schools and high schools, and I have this presentation, and I bring us one slide, and it has a picture of Beyonce, uh, LeBron James, George Lopez, um, Bill Gates, and Yo-Yo Ma. 
And I ask the kids, what does all these people have in common? And they yell out, you know, answers. And I tell them that these people all had 10,000 hours of practice. Now, Beyonce started winning singing contests when she was in grammar school. LeBron James started playing basketball when he was four. Bill Gates, by the time he was a freshman in college, had 10,000 hours of practice and programming. So just like being a singer, an athlete, or the world's richest man, being committed to doing something meaningful and hard takes practice. And y'all have just finished doing something meaningful and hard. That's why we're here to celebrate. That's why we're here to celebrate your achievement. But I want you to continue this trend. I want you to do something meaningful and hard every single day. President Teddy Roosevelt beautifully captured this sentiment, and so I'm gonna use his words. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. And whenever I hear this quote, I always think about a time when I was in Pakistan back in 2006 and 2007. I'm going to end with this story. An earthquake hit northern Pakistan and killed a couple, about 100,000 people. The ambassador in Islamabad, Islamabad is the capital of Pakistan, said, heard you and get a team and go up there and see what, what the Pakistani people need. And this is in the Hindu Kush mountains, about 8,000 feet higher. We get up there and we realize they needed some helicopters. They needed airlifts because there's all these small villages you know, up higher than the, the, this, this area where we were based. And we had been there for four days, and I need to go back down to Islamabad to give a report. And we learned that there's a village that had been without food, water, and power for four days. And by the way, it's negative 20 degrees below zero. So we take our helicopter up to this village, and we open the big bay doors, and all these villagers start piling on this helicopter. And this village elder hands me this little girl. She was about seven or eight years old, and she lost her mother and father in the earthquake. And she's screaming and crying. And if you've ever seen a helicopter crew, they look like Martians. They got black face masks and hoses connecting them to places. And we kind of finally settle her down. And we land in Islamabad, the capital. We open the doors. I put her down. She runs away. And she takes about 10 steps, turns back, runs back to me, gives me the biggest hug I've ever gotten in my life. And then she kisses the helicopter crewman on the hand, and he pats her on the head and gives her the thumbs up, and she runs away. And that girl's face is going to always be seared into my mind because it's an example of how the United States is the only country with the resources and the willingness to help people even if they're 6,000 miles away. And we can do this because our nation is filled with people. Yes. We, we can do this because our nation is filled, are filled with people that are unafraid to do what is meaningful and hard. People like you. And again, I want to say once more, congratulations on such an accomplishment. It's an honor to be here today. And go out and continue to make us all proud. Thank, Thank you. you.